What I want to work towards today is an overview. I want to work towards a narrative, a series of narratives, let's say. Let's constrain the narratives of how this happened. How is it that we come to be residing in such a place? And I'm not really going to deal with the biological business of that so much today, although we'll, we'll start to talk about it later this week. And, um, because I think that's an interesting aspect, you know, life is essentially a chemical reaction that's very bizarre and we need to think about how star systems pull that off. Um, if, we're, if we're lucky, maybe I'll, I'll get my wife to come in here and, and talk to you a bit more about the origins of life because that, that's a, she's the biologist of the two of us. Uh, she teaches in the biology department here and um, she, she just has some really brilliant insight on that matter. It's really, a, it's really one of those places, you know, in science where people have this absolute intractable problem that life, of course, the, the fundamental ground rule of life that we all understood, and Louis Pasteur proved this, of course, is that life only comes from other life, right? You don't just, you know, and people, this was huge because people were trying to figure out how disease worked, and they were afraid of bad air and all of this stuff. It turned out that people were getting infections because the little seeds of life, the bacteria, their spores or whatever, little germs of life were causing more life to grow and oftentimes inside of food sources and water and inside of people's bodies eventually, um, which led to a whole host of diseases. So on one hand, the fundamental principle of life is that it only comes from other life, but at the same time, how did it get here in the first place? And so this is a, a huge area of, of debate and discourse in the scientific community and there's, there's a really rich landscape there to explore. So today we're going to talk about the origin of the solar system and then we need to start looking at Earth uh, because that's the one under our feet and of course that's going to tie into the origins of life and, and really today I want to talk about one aspect of Earth in particular which is its crust and its magnetic dynamics underneath our feet. You know, in some sense we know more about the surface of Mars and Venus than we do about what's happening five kilometers under our feet, which is really perplexing. So there's this great mystery because we have this very wonderful magnetic field and we're going to talk about magnets and how they work today. Hopefully everybody can leave here today and impress their friends with how magnets work because nobody knows. Most people, most people might tell you an equation or something, but let's try to visualize mechanically what could be happening with the atoms involved, and we're going to do that today. But we need to make sense of this because the magnetic field, the, this geomagnetic field, the fact that the Earth has this consolidated magnetic field seems to be critical in our ability to sustain life here. It shields a lot of the really nasty stuff that's coming off the sun, that's coming from the other galaxies, or throughout the galaxy, uh, things that would absolutely destroy your body and your DNA. So this is pivotal, and, and that's what I, I'd like to cover today. And so we will deal with, the, deal with the core and magnetism. But first, let's try to make a story for this solar system in general. And we, we don't have a ton of time for this, but I think that we can, we can view the narrative that's presented, and then we can look at how we came to that narrative, and we can look at where it may be headed in the future. And in some sense, a lot of what we're doing here is we're trying to constrain the different possibilities. I think that's what we do in science, right? I think the fundamental kernel of knowledge in, in human beings is the, is the story, right? This is, in some sense, how we view the world. And I think for most of philosophical history, there was this terrible fallacy that, that the way that biology worked, the way that your brain worked, let's say, the way that perception worked was that you had a map sort of of the different material bodies in the universe. And as you, uh, you, sort of, you sort of compared notes with your eyeballs and your ears and everything else with that map that you had of, of the physical universe, and then you adjust it as you go on. And this turned out uh, to be a complete failure. You know, this isn't how it works at all. When people started working on intelli uh, artificial intelligence uh, in the early days, they, they figured we would have these uh, autonomous, um, generalized robots very quickly, right? Because they figured, okay, well, we'll just, you know, program these robots with a nice map of their surroundings, 
and uh, they'll figure out the rest. And it turned out to be not true at all because what happens is even if you put these robots in the early days, you know, they've made a lot of progress on that, and I, I can explain that, but when you take these robots and you place them even in a really simple environment, say a room with like some, some blocks, right? You, and you say, okay, the robot will be able to see these blocks and understand that they're blocks and move and, and orient themselves. But the problem is, as soon as the robot moves its position, the block no longer looks like a block to the robot because depending on your relative position to an object, it looks very different. You change the lighting a little bit, the robot has no idea it's a block anymore whatsoever. And so there's more to that. It turns out that actually the way that we operate in the universe is we actually see things in terms of their meaning. That is, what they mean to us. Is this thing going to get in my way or not? And how do I fix that problem? So everything that you encounter in the world, you have to encounter it through stories of meaning and what it means to you and your operation in the world. And that's more appropriate to how we actually look at uh, the world, and that's actually how these artificial intelligence researchers and robotics researchers are now approaching the problem. They're actually trying to embody that cognition in the robots so that they can actually learn from their experiences and actually orient themselves to the meaningful interactions that they have with the world so that they can navigate it properly. So that it doesn't matter if this isn't a, a block, it's something that they have a, a working experience with. And so, what I'm trying to say here is that the fundamental approach to science that we can just look at it in this very physical sense, and in some sense physics is the prototypical science because it does try to break everything down into material bodies and their interactions, but in some sense that's not the way that human beings understand things. And so we have to go a bit further than that. And we have to look at this, this, this project that we're undertaking here of science as this the systematic narrowing down and constraining of this sea of possibilities. We constrain those, po we look at something and we say, how could this be? And we make a story up, you know, it could be any arbitrary story. And then we slowly whittle away at it with observational evidence, is one hand, the empirical side, but we also can whittle it down rationally, right? This cannot be so, this is impossible because our first principles prevent it. You can't have two objects, let's say two bodies, can't be in the same place at the same time. That's really the fundamental principle of physics, for instance. So you can rationalize a lot from that, right? You need to have material bodies in order to have physical action. So you, that kind of throws out a lot of the superstitious claims, right, on their face. And this is why people have you know, almost a religious reverence for science in our day and age because it's been able to constrain that sea of possibilities, that sea of narratives, that sea of meaningful presentations down to something that's workable. And we can all be on the same page that way, that's the hope at least. <coughs> Excuse me. But it's in some sense an ever-receding horizon at all times, right? The more that we learn, the more that we question our fundamental assumptions about things, and the more that we have more possibilities that appear. And so what's really interesting about the story of our solar system is that we have, tried on all, we have tried on all kinds of possibilities over the last, say, three, four hundred years since, you know, Galileo's day, since, since we got this Copernican model that there are these bodies revolving around the sun. Well, how did they get there? What are they doing? Why are they doing it? And there's been a lot of ideas tried on over the years, and what's really funny is that after trying on all these different possibilities, we've essentially gone back to our 1700s model which is something called the nebular hypothesis of the solar system. And that's what we're going to start with, and that's what we're going to end with in this story. Um, with a few excursions uh, into, the, into the indigenous realm to see, see what other peoples have made of the solar system. Okay, so that, that initial idea, the nebular hypothesis, was proposed by uh, really three gentlemen in the, in the 18th century. That's in the 1700s. Um, this was Emanuel Swedenborg. Swedenborg, Immanuel Kant, and Pierre Simon Laplace. Uh, these are just philosophers and mathematicians who were trying to address the problem that essentially arose with the new conception of the heliocentric solar system. And the basic idea is, is some, somewhat simple. You have, uh, you know, this protoplasmic, you know, nebula, let's say. The nebula uh, essentially starts to experience gravitational attraction at some point, you know, as, 
like we keep coming back to this figure skater analogy, right? When you bring in a lot of, a lot of mass and you have a little bit of motion, that motion accelerates into a spinning motion, right? A figure skater does this by bringing their arms in. And the same thing is thought to have occurred with the, this, this gravitational collapse of these nebula. And so people understood this uh, a long time ago, and this was the basic idea that, of course, the star would form as, as the central nucleus where the most stuff was. Uh, and then, you know, the planets would sort of nucleate out of what was left over. And there turned out to be, there turns out to be uh, actually a lot of issues with that. And, and we'll go through them, and, and people have tried to address them over the years um, to varying levels of success. You know, one thing that's perhaps most troubling about this model, there's two very troubling things about our modern model. One is that the most dense thing in the solar system is under your feet right now. Now, that's really perplexing, right? Because if you think about this whole figure skater business, you would think that the most dense things would end up in the center inside of the sun. And that doesn't appear to have been the case. And so, you know, when I read the, this, this modern narrative, the one that you'll find in your textbook this week, I, 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 I sense that there's a long way to go on this problem. Um, the other issue with that is, is that, you know, it's possible there's a lot of uh, stuff that, it, that the planets form somewhat after the sun. This is thought to be the case. And that perhaps the planets are able to also gravitationally accrete because there's a lot of little pebbles and dust and stuff that, that start to accumulate in this region. The problem is that, and this is a very, very big mathematical problem in physics today, is how do you get little pebbles to stick together without, because what they should do is bounce off each other, right? So you can get little pieces of dust to accumulate mathematically. It's, it's actually pretty simple to do. You can, you can make little pebbles, but getting pebbles to stick together into boulders is an intractable problem. And so this accretion model leaves something, something wanting um, for, for many people, including myself. There's that issue. There's another big issue, too, which is that, you know, we, if we stick with this figure skater analogy, you would think that the sun would have most of the material in motion in that system, right? Now, it certainly seems to have the most of the material based on gravity alone, right? It has the most gravitational attraction. But it doesn't have the most motion in an angular sense, which is really perplexing. So in fact, Jupiter has the most angular momentum. It has the overwhelming majority of the angular momentum in the solar system in terms of its, its, rotate, its, its orbit and its rotation. And the sun has the second most. But Ju Jupiter has, has way more angular momentum. And this is also a sort of intractable problem. Um, and there's been a number of solutions proposed uh, in terms of how this could happen. You know, ways that the, the disk of dust and debris could have transferred the momentum from the sun outward to the, to the other planets and so forth. And this may be the case. But again, you get the feeling that there's, there's some, you know, perhaps uh, open questions that need to be resolved in this, in this idea. And we'll talk about the constraints on that problem set towards the end because in some sense, our ability to imagine what possibly could be um, is governed in science by the constraints that we put on it, the limits that we put on our imagination. And I, I mentioned that there's two sets of limits in science. Um, there's actually been two schools of thought that are at war over the last 2,000 years. One is the rationalist school and one is the empiricist school. Today we live in an empiricist-dominated ac academy, right? Now the empiricists are interesting because they want to construct models of the universe that are entirely based on what they can see and observe. And they don't want to entertain anything which the you know, venerable ancestors would have called hypotheses. They don't want to put placeholders in for this could be the case and so forth. The empiricists say, no, we have to actually show those hypotheses to be true in order to include them in our theories. And this is in some sense a safe bet. It's certainly technologically useful. You don't want to fly, you know, try to jump on an airplane that just has a hypothetical uh, flight capability, right? You want that to be proven out. So the empirical way is really interesting. <clears throat> but the empirical way is also extremely conservative because it doesn't allow you to build theories out of pieces that you might not yet know 
And so the stories that you tell yourself from an empirical perspective tend to be hyper-conservative. They tend to be extraordinarily limited. And so when it comes to something as large and as distant in the past as the formation of this entire place, we have a really, really tightly constrained empirical view of that. And I want to talk about some of the big constraints on that as we, as we move forward. Now, the rationalists, of course, on the other hand, would say, hey, it doesn't really matter, you know, what pieces are missing, we're going to be able to construct a story that makes more sense because they care most about making sense versus, you know, saying the, the, the absolute bare minimum of what we can see. And so a rationalist perspective on the origins of the solar system may be very different than an empirical perspective on the origins of the solar system. And that's really interesting because I think, of course, as in any conflict, the, uh, the truth lies somewhere in the middle of that, that conversation. So, all right. Along those lines, I want to read you a tiny little piece uh, from Cajete, because Cajete has, a, has an interesting view on this as well. And, and you know, I, I think that the indigenous people in some sense are on the outside, have been on the outside, right? The, the Westerners showed up with a lot of these uh, empirically grounded uh, Physis physical, physicist-oriented ideas about the universe, which I, I already hopefully made the point to you at the beginning of this, are, are entirely inappropriate in our, in our new understanding of cognitive uh, science, right? This is not the way that we actually operate in the world. We don't operate just based on material interactions. We actually make meaning out of things in order to navigate the world. And I think that in some sense, um, the indigenous people understood that intuitively. Um, this is from Kehete. He says, the word science has only recently been used to depict systems of knowledge that refer to the multidimensional world of nature and people's ways or traditions or relationship with the world. Use of science by native peoples contains this type of, of un understanding. This use to describe the experience and traditions of native people remains controversial given the biases and scientism of Western scientists. Does anybody know what that word scientism means? Has anybody heard that one? No? Oh, that's a good one. All right, so scientism is the, the quasi-religious belief in a scientific theory. Right, and you, you, this is how you know, science has, you, you see this maybe in the political landscape, especially uh, in the last few years when science actually became interesting to people by and large for the first time. It's this, this idea that you know how things work and everybody else is 100% wrong, right? It's this conviction almost, um, which in some sense threatens the entire enterprise of science because of course we need a free market of ideas in order to be able to move forward. Nobody knows everything, we need to be able to you know, you get in an argument with somebody, you got to keep that 1% chance open in your mind that they have something to teach you about that you don't already know. Herbert Reed, pioneer arts educator, wrote, Science is the explanation and art is the expression of the same reality. That definition has important ramifications for native science. With an indigenous consciousness, science is also an art form which incorporates both an objective explanation for how things happen in the natural world and a way of looking. The idea that science and art are two sides of the same coin is what indigenous people have always tried to convey. And this is also in the margin of Western philosophical thinking as philosophers, artists, humanists, and religious leaders insist that science is part of the greater whole of human expression. In Western society, conflict about the de definition of science has been underway since the time of Galileo when science was separated from religion. Religion became the antithesis of science, although some would describe science as a kind of religion. These controversies continue to characterize Western philosophical traditions. So that's, what I'm, that's kind of what I'm getting at, and I, I actually think that the, the notion that science is an art is absolutely entirely appropriate because, again, we're making stories here, right? Now, there's a special kind of story. All art forms are separated, but what is the goal of art? The goal of art is, in some sense, to order the chaos of existence, right? It's, in some sense, if you look at a, a master musician or a master painter, right, in some sense, they're able to take something as large as the human experience and condense it into a form that's readily accessible by their audience, right? And in some sense, that's exactly what we're trying to do in science. We're trying to take the chaos of existence, the madness that it would appear otherwise, and constrain it down to something. 
And that's what we're trying to do here with this solar system story to some extent. All right, so there's a, uh, this is one of the star forming regions in the Orion Nebula. Um, and this is thought to be, you know, a similar sort of birthplace for our solar system. Um, this is where you have these, these condensing gases, right, that are, that are able to exist in sufficient densities and, and quantities in order to begin to experience this gravitational attraction. Of course, there's a lot more going on than gravity inside of these systems, right? I mean, all of those molecules rubbing up against each other, they end up with a lot of electrostatic, electromagnetic interactions going on. There's organizations of that matter that, of course, contribute. Um, but traditionally, it's been, we've really considered gravitation as the main player in this. Although, uh, you know, from my personal conversations with a number of astrophysicists working at the front lines of this business, those chemistries, those electromagnetic interactions are increasingly being entertained and as a very important in the formation of these stars. So there it is, this, uh, this nebula. And this is where uh, things are, are beginning to collapse. Oh, sorry, this is actually the Eta Carina Nebula. Um, you know, another thing that's really quite interesting in this story is that almost every single other star that we see in the sky has a partner, at least one partner. Some of them have many partners, right? And they, co they have these co-orbital um, dynamics. And we don't seem to have one, which is very, very, very bizarre. And how that plays into the story of our solar system um, could be actually really important, right? But, it, you know, I guess it's worth saying that the primary constraint on the modern story of the solar system is the age of the thing. So, if we want to say, maybe we had a partner in the past, and maybe some of the planets that are sitting here today came from that partner, and maybe the history of that partner is much older. Well, the problem with making a story like that, which many rationalists would probably be tempted to do, is that the empiricists say, hey, we've never seen anything older than four and a half billion years old, right? Every single rock that we've ever dated in this solar system, the oldest ones that we've seen, including the meteorites that, that fall upon us, none of them appear to be older than four and a half billion years. So that's the primary constraint on the story that we're telling here. But I think that that's not an entirely fair constraint. And I'll tell you why when we talk about radiocarbon dating here in, in just a little bit. But keep that in mind as to, as to why we don't include maybe our, our, the possibility of our sister star in the origin of these bodies. So one of the first people to really pick up uh, and, and try to mathematically reason with the dynamics of how this collapse happened and how these planets formed and so forth was Rene Descartes. And we've talked about Descartes uh, at least, I think, several times, and maybe in the first lecture, because Descartes gave us the definition for a hypothesis, which I think is extraordinarily robust and better than anything you're going to get in any of your science classes. And, and Descartes, of course, said that a hypothesis is a supposition which is not taken to be true, but if true, would be sufficient to explain your theory, right? It's the hinge point of something you can't see yet. Maybe we'll be able to see it in the future. So, of course, Descartes was a rationalist in this sense. He loved the idea of hypotheses. Now, the empiricists today would say you can't use those hypotheses unless you can prove them to be observationally so. And that's where we're at in the modern world. So anyways, Descartes had this idea that this, uh, he, he had a vortex conception of everything. His, his idea of atomics were that atoms were little vortices in this luminiferous ether. Um, and I actually think there's a great deal of merit to that, which we'll talk about later. Um, but uh, he wrote about this in the 1600s, and this was in some sense before Kant really picked up the idea and developed it into the nebular hypothesis that we essentially have today. Let's see what else we have to say about that. There's a few, uh, so, so after this idea was set forth, people played with this. They played with it heavily in the 1800s and in the 1900s. Actually, people were still arguing about this all the way up through the 20th century. Uh, in some sense, people were trying to understand how it was that these rocky bodies got there, right? I, t I pointed out to you at the beginning, it's, it's sort of a perplexing issue. Now, this uh, wonderful uh, British astronomer named James Jeans had this idea that perhaps 
uh, we did have a sister star, or perhaps a star passed very nearby the sun and it ripped off little blobs of material which, which coalesced into the, uh, the planets. And, um, you know, this was very unpopular. Actually, a lot of these ideas uh, that involved catastrophes and reorganization, sudden reorganization of the solar system were very unpopular because you've got to keep in mind that in the 1800s, there was a huge battle going on between the religious fundamentalists and the rational empirical scientists, right? And the, the religious fundamentalists were huge champions of catastrophism, right? They took this, the flood stories from the Bible as literal, and, and everything they saw on the landscape pointed to those explanations. And so catastrophism, the idea that things could change very suddenly, was very much opposed by the scientific community. And I think we still hang on to that. And in some sense, I think that we hang on to it because it's comforting to, to not look at things like that, to think that everything progresses in this uniform fashion, which is very predictable and understandable. And in some sense, that's a very ordering, comforting narrative. It's, a very, it's very nice to believe that. Um, whether it is true or not uh, is in some sense up for debate. I mean, we're, we're very much aware at this point that, that periodically, let's say every 100,000 years or so, the Earth goes through a glaciation cycle, which is quite catastrophic, as you can imagine. You know, uh, we, might, we can do everything we want to combat climate change, but these glaciation cycles aren't going to end anytime soon, and we're going to have to reckon with that. And so, in some sense, I think that the more appropriate approach would be how do we make peace with the natural catastrophic cycles of nature and, in some sense, build our society robust enough that we can handle those changes. We're not going to stop them. So, so, this title, Bulge Idea, was entertained for a while. Um, a number of people worked on that. Forrest Moulton, Chamberlain. Um, the companion star collision was entertained all the way up into the 1930s. Maybe another star just straight up smashed into our star and unleashed the planets at some point. You know, again, people hate catastrophism, and, um, and those didn't, didn't stick around for whatever reason. And so you start to get the impression that people tried on all of these different ideas for what could have happened. And it persisted, this problem persisted that... Uh, how do you get all of the, how do you solve this angular momentum problem? How do you solve this accretion boundary problem? And those are still quite open problems. This gentleman showed up uh, in the 50s, a uh, very, 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 uh, just one of my favorite scientists of all time. Uh, his name was Hannes Alfen. And, and Alfen actually studied the role of electricity in, in celestial processes. And he actually gave us our modern model for how the sun cycles work, the sun spots, the surface of the sun, these coronal mass ejections, all of this, the, basically the magnetic behavior of the sun, uh, all came down to Hannes Alfen uh, through this project he developed called magnetohydrodynamics. Well, Alfen was the first person to come along and say that he actually had a legitimate mechanism for how it was that the angular momentum was transferred from the sun outward to a planet like Jupiter. Um, and his mechanism seemed to make sense. It was something like this, this idea that you basically had this frictional level that was transferred friction. Some of that angular momentum was transferred into the rotation of the dust as you moved outward into the solar system. And, uh, you know, this worked. And, and other people worked on these models, too. And actually, the Soviet scientists between the 1940s and 1980s, um, particularly Otto Schmidt, uh, and so forth. They, they really developed the ancient idea of this nebular hypothesis to account for, you know, these new ideas of angular momentum breaking uh, and actually give us the idea that we have, this, this modern model that we have today. Um, let's see. There was supernova explanations for how this angular momentum was, was transferred. Maybe our companion star just blew up suddenly and, and transferred a lot of angular momentum away from the sun to, towards the, the outer planets, um, particularly Jupiter. All right, 
Well, gravity holds the planets to the, the sun, right? But angular momentum is, is that, it, it's really just, the best way of thinking about it is it's a, it's a measure of, of, this, of a particular kind of energy. So energy just means the amount of material in motion. Whenever you see that nebulous word energy, it's not some superstitious quantity, right? It means some material is in motion. And so in, a, in an orbiting body, there's a particular motion which is angular, right? In other words, it's rot it rotates, right, in this, you know, elliptical fashion. So it's the amount of motion combined with the momentum, right, how much stuff is there and, and how much motion is together. And so we put a value on that. We put a quantity on that. Uh, it's, it's an energetic uh, value. Yeah. And so in this sense, what we mean is Jupiter is, is orbiting really fast, considering how much stuff is inside of Jupiter. The sun is actually turning relatively slow compared with how much stuff is in it. And when you compare those two quantities, Jupiter wins out, which is, is bizarre because the entire story hinges on the idea that the stuff at the center moves fastest, and that's how you accrete the sun in the first place and everything else. So it's not a small problem. It's not a small problem. But the magnetic braking business from Alphen uh, seems to have satisfied many people. Um, the frictional braking added to that, of course, and like I said, the Soviet scientists cleaned that up all the way through the 80s. Um, but people were debating this heatedly throughout the 80s, and to some extent, they're still debating it today. Um, I, I, would not, I would not expect that the story that you find in your textbook today will be anything like the one 100 years from now. So that's really cool and exciting. I, I don't know that you'll, you'll encounter that in many other sciences. All right. Uh, yeah, lots of people ha have considered the same idea. The blebbing off idea of planets, too, has remained popular. It's resurrected from time to time. Uh, now, another thing that's really, really challenging our, our basic idea of the planets forming is that when all of these hypotheses or these theories were introduced, it was sort of assumed that the planets formed exactly where they are. But, you know, the more that we've in the last 10 years been able to watch other solar systems, in some sense we've confirmed some of our understanding, right? We do see these disks and we do see planets, well, we can't watch a planet form, but we see little, little planets inside of these young disks, and we see that they're sweeping out their orbits, right? They're causing little voids behind them as they grab stuff up. So this does seem to be happening. But at the other time, another thing that we see uh, is something that we should probably consider in our modern solar system model. Because what we see is that oftentimes these really big planets, like the Jupiter-sized ones, they actually are at the interior of the solar system. In fact, they're almost always found at the interior of the solar system. Whereas in our solar system, Jupiter, Saturn, these big, you know, giant planets, they're actually quite far away. And um, so, you know, we can couple this with another observation, which is quite intriguing. Those big, fat, giant planets, the ones that are near uh, the sun in these exosystems, right? A lot of them are so near the sun that you can actually see the, the atmosphere getting cooked off, evaporating from them. So there's this new idea, this is brand spanking new, that planets, especially giant planets, not only, not only uh, it's, it's less new that they might migrate outwards, right? This has been used uh, all the way back into the 70s to explain uh, some things about the solar system. But the idea that the, the actual size and shape of these planets could change over their evolution is somewhat a, a novel idea. And I think that it's, I think it's difficult to look away from because what would happen to a Neptune or Jupiter if you cooked off its atmosphere? Anybody? What would it look like? Take a guess. Well, we haven't really talked about Neptune or Jupiter, but what's really interesting is at the core of Neptune, Neptune's a really good example, at the core of Neptune or Uranus is something very rocky, very terrestrial actually, very much 
looks a lot like our rocky planets here at the inner interior of the solar system. So, the question becomes, how long would it take to cook off a Neptune and get it down to looking something like an Earth or something like a Venus? And the answer is a really, really long time. Or it was really, really close to the sun. Or none of this happened whatsoever and things formed exactly as they are in place, which is the story that you'll find in the textbook. Right? In some sense, that history remains constrained by the timetables of this entire operation. So, you know, a lot of these, uh, I would say most of the solar systems that we've seen with our, our new Kepler uh, satellite, which is actually able to look at these exosolar systems, and we've identified thousands of them at this point, most of them have these types of planets that, we, that the most common type of planet is one that we don't even find in our own solar system. It's called a super Earth. And the super Earth is actually something very much in between an Earth and a Neptune, right? Its, its radius is somewhere in between the two. Its composition is somewhere in between the two, right? And in my mind, this is a really, really intriguing aspect of, the, of a hypothesis which is on the table, which is that there is actually a progressive evolution of one type of planet into the next. Of course, again, why is that not a very popular idea today? Because the timetables required for such an evolution are far longer than the four and a half billion years that we have to work with. Yes? What would happen to like a, like a gas planet like Jupiter if its atmosphere was cooked off? Would it just like get smaller and look more Earth-like too, like uh, Neptune or? Yeah, so I pick Neptune because Neptune's composition is, is in some sense you know, what is Neptune made out of? It's made out of a lot of the same stuff we find here, right, in different quantities. So there's a lot of water there, a lot of water. There's a lot of uh, hydrocarbons, right? A lot of the basic stuff that we would need for, to make an Earth out of, to make the, this biosphere, right? And it also has a core which is not, you know, which is thought to be actually quite similar to this silicate iron business that most of our Earth is made out of. Now, Jupiter, you asked about Jupiter, on the other hand. Jupiter is a bit more mysterious because Jupiter's composition is very similar to a star, actually. It's mostly hydrogen and helium. And it's thought that the hydrogen is under such extraordinary compression at the center that it's in this sort of liquid metallic form. Um, were Jupiter to be cooked down? Well, were Jupiter to be cooked down, perhaps the tension or the pressure on it would, would lessen, right? It would weigh less, and so it would be squeezing itself less. And perhaps that hydrogen core, you know, if there's no rocky core to Jupiter, perhaps that hydrogen would enter a new phase and it would just eventually turn into gas. So I wonder if Jupiter wouldn't just evaporate eventually, right? Because it would just turn into a big ball, of, a small ball of gas eventually, and then it would just be gone. So um, that's why I choose to focus on Neptune and, and some of the other giant planets like that, Uranus as well. Um, and Saturn's actually a bit more like Jupiter in that sense, in terms of composition. But these, these Neptune ones and these super-Earths are really intriguing piece. There, you know, of course, this is a rationalist presentation that I'm giving you now, right? There's no actual evidence for this happening in, sen in the sense that we can't actually see it happening. Of course, these things take millions, perhaps billions of years. And, and the rationalist perspective that I'm giving you is, is clearly opposed by the empiricists who say, hey, you can't say the solar system is that old because we haven't found anything that old yet. Now, there may be a reason why we haven't found anything that old, and I'll talk about that uh, as we move forward, but I wanna make sure I have time to talk about magnets here. So what's the ultimate fate of the sun? This is something that, that comes up in pop science all the time. And this actually could, uh, this is actually any, another mo even in, more intriguing uh, piece of this hypothesis. I mean, if we wanna really throw the timelines out of the window, well, what happens to the sun? You know, it has this birth thing we've talked about, it glows and progresses, and we'll get into this next semester. If you want to learn how stars really work, we'll, we'll deal with that uh, in great detail next semester. But at some point, the thing essentially uses up its fuel, and it's no longer a stable structure. And it, it sort of sheds its outer layers, and it remains this glowing core for a while. Um, but at some point, you know, something like a thousand trillion years from now, oh, over on this side, what does it turn into? What does the star turn into? 
Well, it turns into a, a hunk of rock, essentially. Right? It's whatever the heaviest stuff left over there that's cooled off. So after like a thousand trillion years, the Earth is thought, it, sorry, the Earth, the, the star, our sun, is thought to cool down to something around 4 Kelvin and just be this kind of remnant crust. You know? I imagine it would look a lot like a moon or something. Now, does that matter? Does it matter that stars, many stars, would meet this fate over a span of thousands of trillions of years? Well, it doesn't matter in modern astronomy because we have another constraint on things. And the constraint that we have right now is that the universe itself is only 14-ish billion years old, right? That's a very short amount of time if you consider that life began some three billion years ago on our own planet, right? It's very, very strange. And, and actually, you know, I, I, I'm very skeptical of this, of this date myself. Um, if for no other reason than, you know, our sun has chemical elements in it, uh, not, well, it has elements in it that indicate that it had to have been formed from other stars. And so it's thought that our star is, let's say, a second, maybe third, fourth generation star. So stars must have gone through this entire cycle several times in order to produce our solar system. Because the elements that we have, the really big, heavy elements, can't be formed in a tiny little star like ours. They have to be formed in huge stars with enormous mass that can crush down and, and fuse these huge elements, right? Actually, the supernovas, the explosions themselves of these large stars lead to the formation of some of these elements, it's thought. And so again, these timetables are highly, highly constrained. And, and I wonder, I wonder how much of that will persist in the next hundred years. Okay, so how do we come up with these dates? I, I suppose it's time for us to talk about that briefly. Well, originally, the way that we dated a lot of these bodies was by looking at the craters on their surface, okay? So we look at something like the moon and we say, oh, that thing's really old, it's been punched a bunch by everything, okay? Um, well, that turns out to be not the best model for how to date something, although, you know, there can be some sense made from craters in terms of the layering of them and so forth. But, you know, Craters on our planet, they don't last very long. It's actually very, very difficult to detect impacts from even several thousand years ago, let alone hundreds of thousands, millions of years, how about billions of years ago? You cannot find these things, all right? So surfaces are remodeled. They're remodeled by the, all sorts of seismic and tectonic processes, and we'll talk about that, but essentially the Earth is just a, a bubbling vat of liquid underneath, and it's, the crust seems to be periodically recycling itself um, which is the basis of, in some sense, our modern plate tectonics theory, which we'll, we'll touch on in a moment. So, the more reliable, right, the more reliable approach that the empiricists lean upon in constraining these narratives is radioactive decay. Okay, and I, I touched on this briefly, so I won't bore you to death with it, but I want to go over it one more time. The idea is that elements, especially really big, heavy atoms, they're not stable. It's hard to keep a structure together that's really, really complex and big. And so they fall apart over time. And they fall apart in a really predictable fashion. So as something falls apart, like, say, uranium, an enormous atom, as it falls apart, it falls apart into these daughter nuclei, and we can detect those daughter nuclei, and we can detect the parent nuclei, right? There's advanced means of spectroscopy that are used to detect these. They basically grind it up or let's say they atomize it with, with a great deal of heat, and they can look at the relative uh, uh, amounts of these different elements in a mixture, okay? So you compare the parent, say uranium, to, to the presence of its daughters, like say lead, and you can create a map of that ratio, and you, if you understand the rate at which it decays, then you can actually create something that gives you a timeline for when it was born in the first place. So that's a lovely story, and it turns out to be really reliable. In fact, what's wonderful about this method is that each one of those daughters also decays in its own way, oftentimes. There's sometimes unstable isotopes of those daughters, and they'll decay. So in a single sample, you can get multiple uh, timelines, and they should all intersect as to the time of their formation. And in fact, they do, and they call these... These, uh, these graphs, they call them isochrons because they, they are able to point at one date together using multiple pieces from one sample. And this is, you know, an absolute 
master class in engineering to be able to deduce the date of something that's billions of years old based on this method. However, the one thing that you'll never hear printed about this is that it can only tell you the last time that rock melted. Because what happens when a rock melts is that it incorporates fresh material into it, fresh uranium. So if there's a supernova next door to us, what's it going to do? It's going to cook everything in our solar system. It's going to inject fresh uranium into everything in our solar system. So I think that a more reasonable approach to radioactive dating is that what it tells us is the last time something really bad happened in our solar system. Okay? And if that's the case, then this place might be a whole lot older than it appears. We don't know. Now, we do constrain our model of the solar system with respect to the story of our cosmos in general. But that story about the Big Bang, well, it, it's on the move. I'll, I'll tell you that much. You know, cosmology is, in, is, is uh, I, I don't want to say it's threatened, but there's some serious problems with this Big Bang story that have been popping up. And maybe if you read pop science headlines, you've seen some of these, right? Um, and we don't have time to get into the cosmology and the birth of our universe and stuff in this class. We'll do it next semester. But needless to say, I want you to open your mind to the idea that these timetables are, are on the move, at least. We need, to, we need to at least consider the idea that, that maybe these things took a lot longer than they did. And maybe, maybe these planets didn't form exactly where we think they did. Maybe there's much more to this story than we think. So... I'm going to move on to talking about the Earth because I want to, t I want to talk about magnets while we're done. I actually uh, built a little toy that I want to show you guys, and I don't want to have to bring it back next week or next Thursday. So it's, it's very janky. I don't know if it'll survive the trip. Um, does anybody have questions about the formation of the solar system? I know this was absolute light speed uh, overview. I, I apologize, but, you know, we, we have a lot to get through. And in some, sense, in some sense, this isn't the last time we're going to be talking about it. Every, we're going to be moving. We'll talk about the Earth. We'll talk about Mercury. We're going to go through each of the planets. They all fit into this story, and they each have their own formation stories that you know, specialists are working on, and those, in some sense, feed into the larger picture. But I hope that by the end of this course, you can come up with your own idea about what you think is the story of our solar system. You can put all these pieces together, and you don't need me to tell you some fact about it, right? You're going to have a, a bunch of information. You're going to have a bunch of ideas. And it's up to you. And I really think that that's the way that science works best. I think that we should all be able to look at these different possibilities and, and take away what we want from it. Like, what works for you? What makes sense to you? You know, you'll have all the information. But I don't think that it's reasonable or correct to say that there's one version of this story. There's a safe version of the story, and that's the one you'll find in the textbook. But there's serious problems with it as well. And so I wouldn't want you to think that that's the only thing that's available to you. Any questions? All right. You know, strange thing, the strangest thing about our Earth is that we don't see any other of, of these things when we look out into the sky, right? We haven't found another planet that looks just like this. And in some sense, the Earth is in an amazing place in the solar system because it's at just the right distance from the sun that it can sustain liquid water. You know, nobody else can do this in the solar system. Everybody's too close or too far away. And so maybe, you know, the reason we don't see a lot of Earths when we look at these other solar systems is because one of these planets hasn't found itself into the right place with the right stability of orbit that it can hang out there long enough to, to develop this beautiful biosphere that we have. You know, in some sense, when you look at the Earth, you're looking at a, a living system, right? This, this thing looks the way it does because it's alive in some sense. At least it has a living skin on it, and that's really unique. Uh, what did I want to say about this? Um, the Earth is, in some sense, of course, the way that we standardize our units of measurement. When we, when we start looking at the other planets in the solar system, we're going to be talking about all of these different attributes. I mean... We're going to talk about atmospheric pressure on other planets. Sometimes it's enormous. Sometimes it's non-existent. But we always just define the atmospheric pressure in terms of ourselves, right? The unit of pressure that we'll use is the atmosphere. And of course, for us, that's one. Well, we'll talk about how far they are away from the sun in astronomical units. And of course, Earth is one astronomical unit. 
away from the sun. And then we'll talk about how big their periods are, right? And of course, we standardize that to ourselves as well, the period of the Earth being one year, right? So we'll talk about how many Earth years all of these orbits are, right? It's very, it's very useful for us to think about everything in terms of ourselves. Now, the Earth, uh, the understanding, like I said, it, we don't know... We don't know with a great deal of accuracy what's going on beneath our feet. In fact, we have to infer that. And a lot of what we infer from it comes from trying to understand how this, this mysterious magnetic field is able to uh, persist. So this is actually a pretty, I think this is from your textbook, but I think it's in some sense quite outdated. But it's the, it's the picture that I got when I was you know, go, taking astronomy uh, when I was your age. And what you see is this basic layout. You have an inner core, an outer core, and then you have this mantle stuff, right? And then the crust on top, which is this very thin layer. Um, the problem is this mantle thing uh, and this inner core, this outer core, there do appear to be these laminar regions, but they're not really so distinct is the thing. This mantle thing doesn't appear to just be this solid rocky stuff, right? It's fluid in some sense. It's, it's under great pressure, this rock. And so... Um, you know, it's more of a continuum than it appears in this picture. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, the, the center is very hot and liquefied and so forth, but it's increasingly apparent that there's something solid at the center of the Earth, and this proves really important in sustaining the magnetic field. Um, you know, <clears throat> the Sun also has a magnetic field, but the Sun's magnetic field is really unstable. Well, it's quasi-stable, it's bistable, right? So every 10 years or so, the Sun's magnetic north pole reverses. This is really important in the sunspot spots cycle, and there's, there's overtones to this, and they, they probably are very important in uh, the sort of radiation levels that we get on Earth, and, and they are, and they actually inform a lot of the climate on Earth. Um, the Earth is, has a much more stable magnetic field, as in it doesn't change its poles very often. Maybe every million-ish years or so it does. Actually, it appears that we're, we're on the brink of one of these reversals now. Our, our North Pole is wandering quite a bit in the last hundred years. Um, and, and there's no reason to believe that that's catastrophic in the past. Um, nor is it catastrophic for the Sun. It simply inverts its polarity every once in a while. But the Earth's is very stable, and part of the reason it's so stable has to do with this solid inner core. Right? And we'll talk about that when, when I get to these magnets in a second. Um, the way that people know about these layers is actually quite interesting. This, uh, this method was developed by this Danish geophysicist um, named Inge Lehmann, who, who you can see over here. Uh, and Lehmann developed this idea that sort of just like light travels, uh, it refracts differently in different densities of, of, of material, right? Um, this is how lensing works. Well, the same thing could be done with acoustic waves inside of the Earth. And so different uh, layers, different densities of the Earth are going to def deflect the sound waves uh, appropriately. And by looking at the way that earthquakes resound across the, uh, from one side of the Earth to the other, you can actually reconstruct these maps of density. And that's how they ended up with this sort of uh, shell-like model of the Earth in the first place. I mean, this was all the way back in the 1930s, which is quite incredible. Um, Thinking about the crust a little bit, you know, the crust uh, only covers about half the Earth's surface. Um, a lot of it is submerged under the oceans. Uh, and there's a few different types of rock there. So there's the continental crust. That's, that's mostly the one that's exposed that we see for the most part. That's made out of granite, which is a particular form of uh, magma that's cooled. It's, it's undergone some interactions with water. Um, which have, have led it to have a different characteristic. Um, the rest is basalt, right? So most of the ocean floor is considered basalt, and that's generally the stuff that squishes out of these volcanoes. You know, if you go around to these volcanoes in Oregon, you'll find most of the rock is basalt. Um, and of course, it's just going through this cooling process. Um, these are, these, both this basalt and granite are considered types of igneous rock. That's the stuff that's, that's magmatic and then cools in some sense. The other type of rock is this sedimentary rock, which is sort of just the pile up of debris through uh, the, the washing of the oceans and, and the movement of, that, of these sand particles across the surface of the earth. Um, and then there's this really interesting uh, type of rock too called metamorphic rock, which comprises some part of the earth's crust. Metamorphic is, is a very interesting uh, 
it's a kind of nebulous word that means either something that's metamorphic or sedimentary, but it's been altered by some other physical process. You know, maybe there's been earthquakes or reheating of it somehow, and that's caused it to be warped in, in certain interesting ways. There's also a little bit of primitive rock that's found on Earth. This is from asteroids and meteorites, right? Um, and compositionally, it's quite similar to the Earth, but it's much older. Uh, most of the rocks that we find on the surface of our Earth don't date beyond a couple of billion years because, of course, the Earth's surface is being remodeled. It's actually only that I know of two rocks that have ever been dated uh, back as far as four, four billion years. Um, and that's how quickly this thing is being reshaped all the time. All right. You know, the uh, most popular idea uh, that for how the Earth got to look like this is called plate tectonics. I'm sure you guys have heard of it. Uh, the basic idea is that these uh, continental uh, plates are shifting around. You know, actually the guy who came up with this, um, he, uh, he was sort of laughed out of the room at first because he didn't have a means, a mechanism for how this could possibly happen. Um, the reason that it was actually eventually entertained had to do with uh, many things, but one of the most interesting was the appearance of fossil bands across the continents. So this map here shows you some different fossilized creatures from you know, many millions of years ago whose remains were detected in bands that overlapped across the continents. So you find, say, this particular, you know, what is this thing, a Sinognathus, this little lizard guy? Well, you find his fossils, or her fossils, from South America dated to the same period that you find those same fossils on the coast of Africa, where coincidentally those crusts, those crustal plates appear to link up very nicely, right? And so, you know, people tried really hard to ignore this uh, plate tectonics idea and say, okay, there might have been a land bridge there or something, um, but it's, it's very it, it doesn't seem to work out, particularly when you look at the fact that the age of the ocean floors appears to be only about 200 million years. It seems that the, the floor of the ocean is being resurfaced continually. Okay? Now, so they've drawn these borders uh, where there appear to be these, these fractures, and it allows us to reconstruct this map of, of the Earth in the deep past. And, um, you know, eventually, uh, Wegner, his name is Wegner, uh, with a W, and Wegner uh, championed this tectonic idea, and the, the way that he was able to actually get this idea through uh, was because of the idea of subduction, right? So the idea that one plate would essentially slide under the other, and, and this would allow for this churning motion, and, con and eventually the proposal of convection cells underneath the Earth's crust that would sort of act as a conveyor belt and shuffle these plates along. <clears throat> now, there's some problems with that, however. Um, as we've actually begun to study the, these convection cells, we haven't been able to, or look for these convection cells that were necessary to move these conveyor belts of these plates along. We haven't really been able to find them. So what we have found, um, you know, and this is, of course, these are the, this is the age of the, the ocean floor, as you can see it. Um, and what you see, actually, is that there's these cracks, and there's very young... Uh, the youngest parts are around the cracks in the ocean floor. And uh, you don't, and you actually see uh, some other cracks right up through the middle of Africa. They're not shown in terms of their age here. This is just dealing with the seafloor. But actually, there's a number of cracks right in the middle of some of these continents, which is very, very bizarre. What's even more bizarre is when people started looking for these convection cells, what they actually found were these things called mantle plumes instead. Um, I'm going to just skip ahead to those. Uh, these mantle plumes they could detect, which is actually, you know, where the magma was bubbling up uh, from below. I think I have a movie of one of these somewhere. It's going to play for me. Okay, here's where the actual mantle plumes are. They have absolutely no correspondence to the plate boundaries, right? So where, the, where these actual cells are doesn't seem to line up with this, this idea. Now, there was another idea that was entertained um, which I think I ought to just mention. Uh, Wegner had a competitor uh, named Warren Carey. This is in the 1950s, not that long ago. And the two sides of the debate were plate tectonics on one hand and Carey's idea of this earth 
which was actually much smaller in the past. And so this is kind of an illustration of, of Carey's idea. If you smash the Earth down to something smaller in the deep past, well, then all of the continents fit together like puzzle pieces perfectly. And you don't need some mechanism of conveyor belts to drag the continents around the Earth all of a sudden. Now, there's serious, uh, the, the biggest problem for Carey in his day was that he didn't have a mechanism for how this would happen. And actually, people tried to do the thermodynamic calculations of how much energy it would take to expand the Earth. And it seemed like you could actually explode every single chemical on Earth, that is, liberate all of the free energy in every molecule on Earth, and you still wouldn't have enough energy to blow the Earth up into the size that Carey had proposed would be necessary. Now, so it died, and plate tectonics uh, took over, and that's the popular theory today. And that's the one you'll read about in your textbook, of course. But um, there's some interesting other ideas here, too. I, I don't think that we should entirely throw Carey's idea out completely. Um, one particular aspect that I think is quite fascinating is, uh, concerns the dinosaurs. Okay? So the dinosaurs were freaking enormous, actually. Um, they were so big that something like a brontosaurus, uh, it's hard to imagine how that thing could have walked without breaking its own legs. If you examine just the sheer forces in its bones versus its size, it doesn't seem possible. Okay? And so people have gotten around this. They say, well, the, the brontosaurus just lived in the water, and so it had some upward buoyancy from the water. It was being, displacing great volumes of water, and that, that took care of things. Okay, fair enough. Um, there's certainly some terrestrial-looking dinosaurs. Maybe all of the big dinosaurs were, were living in the water. Okay, maybe. But you have these very, very bizarre things. They're not technically dinosaurs. Um, they have a different name. I think Quetzalcoatl or something like that. Quetzalcoatl. I don't know. They're, they're these flying dinosaurs. They have wings, okay? But the bizarre thing um, is that these dinosaurs, with their wings, do not possess the proper aerodynamic structures to achieve lift. They couldn't fly with those wings in our atmosphere. And so I had this wonderful conversation with this astronaut uh, named Don Petit, who worked, actually he's from Oregon. Um, at Oregon State, he did his doctoral thesis with uh, this gentleman named Levenspiel. And they proposed a very different model for how these dinosaurs were able to fly. They proposed that prior to the impact of the meteor that wiped out the dinosaurs, that the atmosphere was actually much, much thicker than it used to be. In fact, it was so thick that it gave some buoyancy to these dinosaurs such that they were able to achieve lift. Now, this seems a bit preposterous because you think, okay, well, you know, wouldn't we have some evidence of this in the chemical record? Well, the fact of the matter is that just by thickening an atmosphere, you actually don't change necessarily anything about its comp chemical composition. So right now our atmosphere is, say, 20% oxygen, 80% nitrogen, and a little bit of other stuff. Well, you can still have those same partial pressures and just have a lot more of the stuff, basically. And so the idea that some people have tried to resurrect uh, in the last, you know, maybe 20 years, uh, you know, people, since people have moved on to the plate tectonics, is that, hey, what if the Earth was actually under so much atmospheric pressure at some point? Again, still the same compo chemical compositions. The oxygen was presumably the same, relatively speaking. But it was under so much pressure from the atmosphere that it was sort of crunched down and compressed to something much smaller. And that when that atmosphere dissipated, as we do see the atmospheres dissipating in many of these exoplanets, as that atmosphere evolved, perhaps it unleashed and decompressed the actual structure of the Earth. Now look, I'm not saying this is the case. I'm just saying it's a really interesting idea. And, uh, and, and in some sense, it, it fits, in my mind, uh, it makes a bit more rational sense than the idea of these plates moving on the uh, conveyor belts, which we can't seem to detect anywhere. So those are the two ideas. Uh, just some good food for thought. You can chew it over in your mind, make up your own mind. Um, OK, let's talk about magnets. Talk about the last 10 minutes. I want to talk to you about magnets. Um, in order to understand how the heck we have a magnetic field here, um, we do need to consider how magnets themselves work. This is our magnetic field, I think, over the course of 6,000 years. Um, and you can see it's more or less stable. Those are the two poles in red and blue. Uh, they wander a bit, but they're, you know, it's more or less stable. Um, I think the best place to begin thinking about magnets is actually with the atom, right? 
Now we talked a little bit about the atom before. We talked about how it has this basic structure. The outer shell of it is this thing called the electron, right? This process, actually electron's more of a process. It's a dynamic entity. It's not just like a static table or something. It's in motion. It has momentum. So the outer shell of the atom is doing something. And uh, atoms actually by themselves uh, act like little tiny magnets, which is quite interesting. So if we imagine this as the outer surface of the atom, you know, what we could say is that its electric field points upward here. Uh, it has a north and south. Let's say in this case over here, uh, the electric field is pointing up. They're calling this south. And the magnetic field sort of curls around that. Uh, and so, you know, one way I think to get a grip on at least a way of visualizing what the atom's doing in order to produce this magnetic effect is by thinking about the actual spin of the atom. Now, I made this animation to sort of give you a sense of spin. So electrons have this inherent quantum quantity called spin, and it's sort of thought of as this arbitrary quantity. It doesn't really relate to anything, but it describes their angular momentum in some sense. Angular momentum, how much stuff is turning and how it's turning. Well, what we know about spin is that spin one half, that's the quality of the electron, is that it requires that a point on the surface needs to rotate twice in order to return to its starting point. And for, for that very reason, most mathematicians and most quantum physicists say that it's not a concept that you can imagine in your head, right? It's not something rationalizable that some point would need to rotate twice to get back to its starting point. I, I beg the differ. I think that you can actually imagine it very easily if you draw the surface just like I've done here for you. In some sense, what you do is you can imagine a surface which is actually involuting into itself, almost like Descartes' vortex idea. And in some sense, the surface of that atom is involuting, and it actually has to involute twice as it rotates once. And there you have a point that needs to go through two processions uh, of rotation in order to, or sorry, I said that wrong. It needs to rotate twice while it involutes once to return back to its starting point. So I think this is a very interesting visualization of what we can imagine a potential rational structure for the electron surface of the atom might be that could accomplish this amazing spin one half business. Now, I, I, did some, I want to draw some on the board for you here before I, I get over to this demonstration. Because if we have our atom here, and we say that the electric field is sort of the pole of the atom, in this case I just have it arbitrarily, it's pointing up, then we could say that the equatorial motion of that shell of that atom is representing the magnetic component of it, right? Because the electric field and the magnetic field are, are mathematically defined by being at right angles to one another. So we have our atom, the surface is turning, the outer surface represents the magnetic action, the polar orientation of that motion represents the electric activity. If we string a bunch of those atoms together, these are really simple 1s shell. I noticed the chemists before uh, in some other lecture were looking at all the different shapes of the orbitals. So we're sticking with this very basic s shell right now. If we take our little s shell and we make this hypothetical wire. It's just one atom thick, right? and we put a bunch of atoms end on end. Well, all of a sudden, that electric action at the poles, that motion at the poles can be transmitted from one atom to the next, and we get electric action, right? But we also get the appearance of a magnetic field in the wire that wraps around the wire, because that's the sum total of all of the equatorial motion of those atoms together. We know that wires develop this magnetic field in this exact fashion. So wire, if you have a wire, you run a current through it, you will get a magnetic field that curls around the wire. Now, if you take that wire and you bend it into a coil, you just loop it up like this. Well, what you've done is you've created the most primitive form of electromagnet. And, and trust me, this will play into explaining our Earth's magnetic field in just a moment. But what happens, what you'll notice is if you've taken that wire, you've aligned the curl of each aspect, the curl of that magnetic field, is now consolidated such that the outer surface of this, this coil, all of the surfaces are now rotating down this way together along the edge of each one of those stacked wires together, right? It's like as if I put a bunch of these side by side. You have homogeneous equatorial motion on the shells of those, of those atoms. This is the basic electromagnet because now you've actually unified the motion of those shells in one place. And so the electromagnet is the basis of I would say most of the technological electronic revolution of the 20th century. And I actually built a little one for you here just to show you how this works because 
I think that it's, uh, it's pretty rad. And it's pretty easy to do, actually, yourself at home. So what I've done here is I've actually done this exact same thing. I coiled a wire here. <clears throat> this is just a, a copper wire. It has a little bit of insulation on it. Um, the insulation on the outside of the copper is just to make sure that the electric action doesn't short between the two wires. In other words, that the poles of those atoms don't turn towards the atoms next to them and make a, a smaller circuit than I want. So what happens is when I connect this thing to the battery, there will be a current inside of this loop of wire. And what's going to happen is that that current's going to induce a magnetic field in that wire. Now, I also have these two static magnets here, right? This is the basis for the electric engine. This is the basis for the generator. This is the basis for all of our modern electronic technology. This is how we even do transformers and, and uh, electro and radio antennas eventually, but that's kind of beyond the scope of this. So what I have for you here is a very simple electric motor. Now, these magnets over here, <clears throat> these are, are permanent magnets. They're static magnets, and we don't have a lot of time to talk about those, although if we run out of time, I'll get to it at the beginning of next class. But let's assume that the magnet is permanent in these. There's already a magnetic field in these. It doesn't need electricity to go. But when I plug this in, what's going to happen is that there's going to be a south pole which appears in this magnet here, which isn't even a magnet right now. There's no attraction or repulsion whatsoever. But I've oriented the permanent magnet such that the south pole is facing what's going to be the south pole over here, which means they're going to repel one another, right? because their motions are going to be opposite in, the, in, the, in those atoms. And so what's going to happen is that this south pole, as soon as there's a magnetic field in this coil, it's going to kick this one a little bit. It's going to kick it just enough that it turns over like this. That's going to cause the pole to reverse again because the contacts will change down here. I have these tiny little contacts where it's able to make contact with these nails. It will create a new magnetic field the magnetic field is gone in the wire as it's, as it's in the middle point. There's no magnetic field in it. It's just dead weight. But a new one will appear, and again, the south pole will be facing a south pole, and it will kick it over. And so this is the basic principle for electric motors, and it's all based on this solenoid. So hopefully it'll work. Yeah. There we go. Now, this is a... This basic design can also be used to charge this battery because if I hook this thing up to, you know, say a hamster wheel and I turn it manually, so I disconnect it, I, I disconnect it from this battery for now, and I just turn this thing with a hamster wheel, let's say I just, however you want to do it, you know, you could burn coal and drive it past a turbine or whatever. But what you would happen is you're going to do the same thing, you're going to charge you're going to align all of those atoms just like I did over in this drawing over here. When it goes by this permanent magnet, it's going to align all of those atoms. And then when I turn the hamster wheel, it's going to drive a little bit of that alignment into the wires down here at the bottom, down here. And that alignment can do work, right? Realigning them can do work all the way through the column of atoms, all the way down the wire to, say, your battery. So you could charge your battery up doing that. So this is a really, really basic principle of how a solenoid works and how it is that almost all of our electric technology works today. So I will leave you to contemplate that, and we will talk about how the Earth does it at the beginning of class next time. And I appreciate you guys for hanging around. I'm sorry I went over a little bit. I'll have a good week. Yeah.